And welcome again to The Doctor Is In, brought to you by Bay Area Medical Center. I'm Jim Callow, your host, and today our guest is Dr. Francisco Gomez, who is a cardiologist with Aurora Bay Area Medical Group and has been practicing at Bay Area Medical Center for over 10 years. He received his medical degree in the Dominican Republic and completed his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in cardiovascular diseases, both at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago Dr. Gomez has a special interest in educating patients on cardiovascular disease, conducting cardiac catheterizations, and treating patients with heart conditions. Welcome back to our program. It's been a while. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's been a long time since last time I was It here. has. <laughs> all right. Today we're going to talk about congestive heart failure. So first of all, let's, uh, let's talk about exactly what it is. Um. Congestive heart failure um, is a heart condition characterized by uh, the inability of the heart to keep up or maintain enough amount of blood flowing to meet the body's needs. Um, in other words, this is the heart is unable to pump sufficiently to keep adequate blood flow to all the organs of the body, including the kidneys, the brain, the liver, the legs. Since the heart is then unable to forward all this blood, then all the blood that reaches the heart is not able to be forwarded appropriately, and then it starts jamming backwards. Because the blood gets jammed backwards, what we have behind the heart is the lungs. So the blood basically stacks up in the lungs slowly, but persistently, up until the point that the blood is not able to um, that the lungs are not able to keep up with all these engorged blood vessels in the in the lungs. And then eventually the water that is contained in the blood then starts leaking in the small tiny blood vessels in the lungs. That water eventually leaks into the air sacs and then makes the patients not to breathe and feeling that they are drowning in their cells. And uh, that's when we have a congested lung and therefore the name of congestive heart failure. So the heart fails in order to pump adequately, congesting the lungs, and therefore the name. All right, a good explanation. So what uh, causes congestive heart failure? Anything that can make the heart weak or inefficient can make the heart to fail, either through direct damage of the heart, of the cells of the heart, or overloading the heart. Uh, there's a huge and long and wide number of things that can make this happen. There's a long list. The most common of uh, these causes basically is heart attacks. Um, not all the heart attacks are equal. So therefore, for those patients who are survivors of heart attacks, part of the heart will get damaged. So therefore, it will not pump in some areas of the heart as good as the others. And then, therefore, the heart will be weak. So the, that, was, that is one of the most common causes of, um, of uh, heart failure. Um, malfunction of the heart valves, that's another cause. We have check valves inside of the heart. We have inlet valves and outlet valves, the same as a water pump. So therefore, if any of these check valves, they don't work appropriately, either because they are too narrow or they are not sealing appropriately, then eventually the heart becomes inefficient. And then therefore, the heart will fail in order to pump appropriately. Similar to a water pump. This is just the same mechanism. Other causes of heart failure is long time high blood pressure. And this is a problem that uh, we have in the United States uh, for a long, 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 long time. High blood pressure in short term is not a major problem. But in long term, without having appropriate treatment increases the force of the contraction of the heart. And over time, over years and years and years, it makes the heart to wear out. So therefore, it makes the heart very inefficient in the way that it works. So therefore, it is important to be treated. Another very common cause of heart failure is viruses. So viral infections like the flu and or HIV. And uh, these viruses, they go into the body initially the spread inside of the body, like you have a bad cold, but they go also inside of the heart. And some of these viruses, then they will destroy the cells of the heart, making the heart to be inefficient and or weak at any given time. 
than making the heart failure to happen. Other causes are basically something that we commonly see is uh, chemotherapy. So chemicals or toxins or medications like chemotherapy can also be, can also injure the cells of the heart and then therefore making them weak. Um, other diseases like diabetes, chronic diseases like diabetes um, can make the heart inefficient and then therefore inevitable the patient will end up having um, heart failure. Even too much stress, stress that we cannot avoid in life can also make the heart to fail. And uh, this is something that it is um, relatively new in the last 10 to 15 years is something that um, has been um, published in the research more and more and more. Um, high levels of stress increases the amount of uh, catecholamines and adrenaline in the body, affecting the way that the heart does. And uh, you might have heard, Jim, uh, out in the news, uh, broken heart syndrome, for example. And uh, this is uh, something that we see not very, very, very often, but at least once a month or once every two months, we see one of these cases in the hospital where um, patients, they are under a lot of stress, either, either by grieving uh, a family member and or through a divorce or um, any other problems. And then they end up in the hospital with significant amount of shortness of breath or chest pain, and uh, they end up having heart failure because of this condition. All right, so um, how common is congestive heart failure? Well, Jim, this is, this is a huge problem. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very common. Five millions uh, of Americans are living with heart failure currently. Um, that implies that uh, approximately half a million, uh, 500 to 600,000 cases are diagnosed each, each year. Um, and that makes each state to have about 10,000 cases per year diagnosed. Um, so heart failure basically affects all ages. I mean, you can have children with heart failure. You can have young adults. You can have middle age and uh, elderly patients. And even unborn, you can still have heart failure in unborn um, in babies. Um, they can develop heart failure intrauterus. So that's, that's amazing, but it can happen. So the fact we're talking about it certainly means that uh, the the heart failure it, it's a serious thing that you. It is it is a very very serious condition, um, very very serious. Uh, definitely is more common in the elderly. In the in the under, elderly, definitely is more common in the elderly, um, and uh, definitely the incidence and prevalence of this condition increases beyond the age of sixty years old. So it is very very serious, regardless of the age. Um, heart failure can be from being a very mild condition to be life-threatening and uh, can be disabling either temporarily and or permanently leading to death or requiring heart transplant in certain types of heart failure. So not, not all the cases of heart failure are the same, the same as not all cancers are the same. You can have skin cancer, or you can have lung cancer. Well, the same happens with heart failure. Not all the cases of heart failure are the same. We have, um, in a technical way of speaking, we have low cardiac output or high cardiac output, uh, uh, meaning that the heart can be very weak versus the heart may remain strong but inefficient. Uh, you can have systolic versus diastolic, meaning that the heart can have a pump problem, meaning that cannot pump appropriately versus cannot relax appropriately. That's basically what the word systolic versus diastolic means. Um, you can have left heart failure versus right-sided heart failure. The heart has four chambers, two upper chambers, two lower chambers. But at the same time, it has two right-sided chambers and two left-sided chambers. So the left side of the heart basically pumps the blood, receives the blood from the lungs and pumps the blood to the rest of the body. But the right side of the heart receives the blood from the rest of the body 
and sends the blood to the lungs. So depending on which side of the heart is affected, then you may have symptoms. Heart failure can also be acute or chronic. So the severity of the heart failure depends on when this happens, if it happens acutely or if it happens chronically, if it is compensated versus if it is decompensated. So therefore you can have flares of heart failure. It also depends if it is valvular versus non-valvular, meaning that if the heart failure depends or, or it is due to a heart valve problem versus not being a heart valve problem. And uh, it can also be differentiated between ischemic versus non-ischemic, meaning if the heart is due to heart blockages, blockages in the arteries of the heart, and or versus a damage of the cells of the heart. Many different kinds. Many different kinds, <laughs> yes. Indeed. All right. Dr. Francisco Gomez is our uh, guest today on The Doctor Is In, and uh, we're talking about congestive heart failure. Let's talk about the symptoms. Well, very, very important part. Um, basically, for the audience to understand that um, what the hallmark of symptoms um, um, are. Fatigue, tiredness, and the hallmark of all is shortness of breath basically, um, that can happen at rest or during exertion. These can be associated as well with or without swelling in the legs, ankles, and feet. A heart failure can also be associated with palpitations, meaning rapid heartbeats. It can be associated with chest pains, any kind. Uh, can be associated with dizziness, lightheadedness, and even syncope or passing out. So patients can experience a wide variety of symptoms, but the hallmark of all those is shortness of breath and swelling. Basically, those are the two, two most important ones. Mm -hmm. In other occasions, um, the water may not only accumulate in the lungs or in the legs, causing the shortness of breath and the swelling, but also can accumulate in the belly and accumulating water in the belly can cause bloating sensation. So some patients, they don't develop swelling in the legs or may not even develop shortness of breath, but they will develop bloating sensation and then the belly will start increasing the girth. And they say, oh, I'm getting fatter. No, it's just basically that you're accumulating more water in your belly due to inefficiencies of the heart. Heart failure can, can also show up alone or in combination or in association with other health, health problems, um, and as a consequence of the other problems, or as a coexisting, or I mean, as a problem that coexists with the others, uh, and your doctor will be able to tell you what the problem is. All right, so uh, now I understand why the doctors get excited when you have uh, a number of symptoms that don't seem to relate to the heart, but uh, they are symptoms of heart failure. That's that is, interesting. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. That's correct. All right. So uh, how, does the, how does the body respond to congestive heart failure? Well, as, as we were talking before, I mean, the body responds to heart failure by retaining water. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's a hallmark. It's just, just water retention. Um, the patients, they get more tired and fatigued and short of breath with or without the leg swelling that we were talking about. The blowing sensation in the belly, shortness of breath that may happen at night sometimes, um, and that this shortness of breath can wake up the patients at night, um, just waking up in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, with shortness of breath, um, with cough or without cough, um, requiring to sleep with uh, two or three pillows in order, not because it's more comfortable, just because they cannot breathe. So therefore, they cannot breathe flat. So therefore, they require two or three pillows in order to maintain the head of the bed up so they can breathe. If you look at just simple logic, if you are accumulating water in your lungs because the inability of the heart to pump, then eventually the water will start building up from low up, from the bottom up of your lungs. So if you lay down, all that water that is going to flood the air sacs, it will flood all the air sacs in your lungs when you lay flat. But if you sit up, then eventually that water will go to the bottom of the lungs, and then you will be able to breathe with half up of the lungs. 
So it's something that the patients do unconsciously, but it's an important sign that the heart is failing. These patients may also um, sleep in a recliner. They cannot sleep in bed, and that's another sign because they cannot lay flat. And then they don't go to the doctor just because they, sleep in, they are sleeping in a recliner. They sleep in a recliner because of a reason. So therefore, it's important to um, keep that in mind. Uh, and or sitting at the edge of the bed in the middle of the night uh, just to catch their breath. Um, when the heart gets very, very weak uh, or the heart becomes very, very inefficient, the blood flow is decreased. And it's decreased to the rest of the organs. So the organs like the kidneys, they start failing. So another sign of heart failure will be problems with the kidneys. Um, the, the bowels, they get bloated, as I mentioned before, uh, with water. And uh, then the patients, they decrease their appetite. So that's another sign of heart failure. Um, the patients, they become weaker, tired, fatigued, as I mentioned. And as a result of all these, the heart can get enlarged. So another response to the body or to the, to, to the, to the organs, to heart failure, is enlarged heart. Since the heart is weak, then all the blood that goes in, all the pressure, makes the heart to balloon. And then the heart will show in x-rays or in other tests like an enlarged heart. And that's, that's basically what we, what we see. Okay, those are all the symptoms. Now, how do you diagnose that it is heart failure? Well, one of the most important things to, um, that we have in order to diagnose the heart failure is the physical exam. Is whenever you go to your doctor and then you just tell the symptoms and then the doctor is going to put a stethoscope on you, right? And it's going to auscultate you. And, but at the same time, it's going to be looking at all your body. So it's going to be looking at your neck. It's going to be auscultating and uh, it's going to be looking at your legs. So the auscultation of the lungs with the stethoscope will let us know how the sounds are in the lungs. If the sounds are normal, it's perfectly fine. But if we hear some crackling sounds, that means that water may be um, going into the air sacs. And every time that we breathe, then eventually the water will end up creating a crackling sound. So crackles or rails will be heard in these kind of cases. Listening to the heart. If uh, the heart fails, then the heart can go fast and or the heart can go out of rhythm. So by auscultating the heart, we'll be able to distinguish this uh, from the normal sounds of the heart. The heart can also give us another clue, extra sounds or murmurs if the check valves of the heart, the, the valves of the heart are not working abruptly. So we will be able to see abnormal sounds that they come from abnormal flow in the, in the, in the valves, either by being too narrow, and then therefore it will give you a, a, a sound like having the tip of your finger on the tip of the hose, okay, it will just create a, a sound like that. And or if the valve is not sealing appropriately, then you will end up having uh, leaking valves or leaking valves that will create some sounds that uh, will give us information. Um, Besides this, um, we also check the veins of the neck. You might have seen some people walking out there that they have engorged veins in the neck. That's an abnormal sound, uh, abnormal sign. So therefore, these uh, patients, since the heart is unable to pump all the blood that reaches the heart, then the blood gets jammed, but not only in the lungs, but it also gets jammed in the veins of the neck or in the uh, vessels that they come from the abdomen into the thorax. So therefore, you can perfectly see that. Uh, and that gives us another clue. And uh, we also check the abdomen. So patients with uh, right-sided heart failure, they may develop water and retain water in the belly. So therefore, we see for water in the belly. We call it ascites. Um, and we also see the response of the liver to this. So there are certain techniques that we can use. And the last one is to check, obviously, the legs and the ankles, okay? So how many people, they don't have swollen ankles, right? And uh, swollen legs, so uh, we check for that um, as well. 
once we have the physical exam, we also check for x-rays because it's so important in order to see how much of the water is contained in the lungs and then how the x-rays can show us that. There are blood tests that we can do in order to check how much the heart is uh, overwhelmed. So when the heart gets overwhelmed with all this water and overload and is inefficient, then starts releasing um, some um, um, proteins that uh, we can check in the bloodstream. The last one is the, an echocardiogram, which is the most important of all the tests um, in order to confirm what type of heart failure the patient has and if the heart is weak or not. It gives us so much information, including all the valves uh, and how the valves are working. All right, Dr. Francisco Gomez is our uh, guest today on The Doctor Is In, and uh, let's talk about uh, the treatment of congestive heart failure. Since uh, congestive heart failure means that the heart fails, either temporarily or permanently, to maintain good flow um, of the blood to the rest of the body, congesting the lungs, and resulting in water retention, the patients basically get intoxicated with water. As simple as that. So it's a water problem. We all think that water is good, but patients who have failing hearts or failing kidneys, they cannot regulate the amount of water that goes into the body. And, and that is a fact. So therefore, in these situations, water is the enemy, basically. Everything in life is in moderation, not too much, not too few. So therefore, this applies here. So water is key in order to maintain life, but too much water then will make patients sick. So how do we treat this? Well, basically with water pills. That is the most important thing at the very beginning. You have to get rid of that extra water in order to make the patient to feel better. That's, that's key. Um, so in the acute setting of the heart failure, the treatment is aimed to improve the shortness of breath by decongesting the lungs with water pills and making the patient to breathe better. Immediately after that, then we also give medications in order to make the patient to feel better, but also to make the heart more efficient. And ultimately, then we can do a lot of tests or different tests, including cardiac catheterizations, um, and or to do surgeries like bypass surgery in order to improve blood flow in the areas of the heart that they are required, if by any chance we detect that there are blockages involved. But if there are no blockages, then we will have to give medications in order to improve the um, function of the cells. There are many other things that we can add to uh, make the heart to be more efficient, including state-of-the-art pacemakers or defibrillators, or even devices that uh, microchips nowadays that uh, we can insert in the arteries of the lungs in order to give us information wirelessly of how the pressures in the lungs are indicating us and uh, indicating us of higher um, pressure and then therefore higher content of water in the lungs preventing the patient to have shortness of breath by giving um, extra water pills whenever it's needed. Um, technology has helped a lot in these cases in order to keep up with this, these things. There are some other um, things that we can do in terms of treatment in um, very, very severe cases of heart failure when the heart is very, very, very weak. Then we can um, implant um, by the surgeons, obviously, um, what we call left ventricular assist devices, which is basically like a little mechanical heart pumps that helps or assist the heart in order to keep pumping blood to the rest of the body um, as a definitive therapy and or as a bridge to heart transplant, uh, which ultimately is the um, ultimate treatment for heart failure. Heart failure basically is, is a condition or a disease that can be managed, cannot be cured completely, but can be managed. Um, and uh, if it is cured, it's cured with a heart transplant, but you're transforming one disease into another just by giving a transplant. Let's talk about the, the long-term outlook for someone who has congestive heart failure. 
the the long term outlook. Um, once diagnosed with heart failure, the life expectancy after the diagnosis can vary widely. So um, it all depends on the type of heart failure. Um, not all the heart failures are the same. So therefore, uh, it also depends on what caused the heart failure and uh, what other health conditions or problems or diseases the patient has at the time of diagnosis. It's not the same uh, someone diagnosed with just um, um, a inefficient heart because of a broken heart syndrome as I explained to you, because of greeting or, um, or having a stress condition, that having a patient with uh, uh, multiple heart attacks, uh, diabetes, and um, strokes, and at the same time, a very debilitated heart. I mean, there are two different patients, and then therefore the expectancy of life will be completely different. Um, it also depends on how weak or frail or strong the patient is uh, and how the patient has behaved before going into heart failure and what happens afterwards. So in general, um, the survival at one year is 78%, uh, which is pretty good overall. Um, three years, 59% of patients, they remain alive. Uh, five years, 50%, that's basically the, the rule. Um, and at 10 years, only about 14 or 15%, they, they, they survive. Uh, but once again, it depends on multiple, multiple causes and uh, how severe the heart failure is and how weak the heart is. Um, so there are a lot of patients, I mean, there are some patients that they can survive this. The patients, they have very, very, have to be very, very conscious about water intake. If you are diagnosed with heart failure, um, the key is to try to avoid fluid overload. Water is... Um, is hidden in, in, in it's everywhere. We're not talking about just water. We're talking about anything that is fluid. It can be a soda, or it can be milk, or it can be um, a ice cream. Anything that is fluid is considered to be water. Even fruit, I suppose. Even fruit, absolutely. Well, you can liquefy fruit and then you just get a smoothie, right? right. So therefore, um, anything can be water. Um, so therefore, it's so, so important in order to maintain a adequate or um, a restricted amount of water with these patients. Usually the recommendation is not to go more than 64 or 48 ounces a day, um, but it all depends on your doctor. Um, and um, definitely, 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 patients with um, a weak heart, they require exercise. So cardiac rehabilitation is key in order to keep the heart strong and keep the heart more efficient. Without those things, um, including restricting salt intake, because remember that salt brings water with it, so it's important uh, to, to, to keep the salt out of the table, okay? Not, no, not to take the shaker, you know? um, then that those patients can, can get better. All right. Well, we're rapidly running out of time, and uh, they wanted me to uh, make sure that people knew how to reach you if they've got any questions. Well, they can reach me um, basically at uh, Aurora Bay Area Hospital, um, and uh, I am uh, at uh, the Cardiac Disease Management Center, um, uh, which is located in the Suite 106. Uh, the telephone number is 715-732-8230. Um, they can call and make an appointment if they want, or uh, they can just stop by the hospital and visit us. Okay, one more thing before we go. They, um, they wanted me to ask about, uh, mm -hmm. of course, coming up next summer, you're going to be in some new digs over there at the brand new hospital. And uh, uh, what are, what, what, how is that going to benefit your patients? Well, definitely with the new hospital, we will be much more efficient in terms of um, having many of the offices integrated in uh, one single um, building, um, as opposed to what we have now. Um, and uh, at the same time, we will have uh, other departments working um, closely, more closely, in such a way that the uh, flow of the patients will be easier, um, and then therefore the um, efficiencies will improve. Okay, looking forward to that next summer. And we thank you for being with us today, Dr. Francisco Gomez, who is the, uh, a cardiologist with the Aurora Bay Area Medical Group at uh, practicing at Bay Area Medical Center. And it's been a very uh, interesting half hour. 
We're glad you could make it. Thank you, Jim. Thank That's you for That's our Dr. Is In program for today. And uh, join us again next time for The Doctor Is In, which is brought to you by Bay Area Medical Center.